Yes. All right, let me let me call the May 21st meeting of the Concord Select Board to order. Uh, our first order of business is to approve minutes of April 16th. We have a motion to that effect. So move. Second. Second. Would the clerk call a roll? Ms. Hotchkiss. Aye. Ms. Bates. Aye. Ms. Ackerman. Aye. Mr. Lawson. Aye. Myself, Linda Escobedo, aye. Thank you, it passes unanimously. The next item on our agenda is a town manager update. Mr. Town Manager. Guess who's muted? I know. Ah. <laughs> I, can't, I, I hate being that guy. Every that single be, call. That should be the Time Time Magazine yep. word yeah. of the year. That mm -hmm. or social distancing, I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, by far, you're muted is going to be the number one said phrase in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's, thank you. Good uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so I'm just trying to get my uh, notes open here. So as you all know, uh, Monday, the governor announced um, a phase one. Uh, well, he announced all four phases of uh, the, his plan to reopen the state, but really our focus on phase one because I think you made it clear that you don't get to phase two if phase one isn't done effectively and that we still don't know yet. I think we have to be, we'll be monitoring case data uh, locally and I think statewide. But certainly in terms of opening uh, our um, offices and things like that to town employees, that has been a heavy focus of, of our activities this week. Uh, first, I'm actually very pleased to announce that uh, most of our outdoor recreational facilities will be open on uh, Memorial Day. Uh, White Pond, which will be open for kind of walking and fishing, uh, the beach may not be open. It needs a little more prep time. And so basketball courts, think, you know, parks, things like that, we, are, we, we said right from the very beginning that um, reopening our outdoor spaces was priority one. Um, priority 1A is, is getting the the Concord Free Public Library reopened as well, but there's there's a lot more to figure out uh, with the Free Public Library situations um, because it is it's it's both an employee space and a public space. And but we are uh, I appointed a reopen task force of mid level managers, and they've been meeting every day this week. And really, uh, it's been extremely productive, very creative, a great group of people to work with. So the focus is. Um, reopening offices for employees and once we kind of have that figured out uh, the guidance is the guidance is restrictive it's not easy you, you, we're not just going to open the doors and everybody's going to come back there's a lot to figure out if you look at the governor's guidance on office spaces so we're working through that um, and we hope to have something announced in terms of opening for employees soon uh, with regards to opening to the general public that's going to take even more work, and so I wouldn't expect. I wouldn't, for members of the public, I wouldn't expect that we'll be open next week. I think it'll. I think it'll actually be a few weeks before we have the um, protocols and and equipment we need in place to protect the safety of both employees and uh, residents. So um, just ask. We just ask people to continue to be patient. Um, one of the things that's clear in the guidance is, you know, groups of ten or more are are still prohibited. Um, mask wearing is still important, is still a, a mandate and, um, both statewide and locally and social distancing is still required. And I just, I just want to make sure that the community understands that, um, we're, we're thrilled to be able to reopen the recreation facilities. We've gotten a lot of feedback that people really want to get out and play tennis and do all that stuff. And, and I've said all the way, all the way along, we really want to try and make that happen for folks, but I, I'm begging quite honestly if people aren't being responsible and uh, wearing face coverings, um, social distancing, not being in groups larger than 10, we're going to have to close them again because the, the, the guidance is clear. You have to do that stuff to keep the facilities open. And I think the board remembers when we announced the closure of those facilities, we didn't physically close them, but because we kept seeing, we kept getting reports, but we get getting reports, but also observing those those guidelines weren't being followed we had to end up physically closing them and so for all those people who have written saying please reopen them um you know please please make sure you um take the precautions you need to do safely uh, i've gotten a lot of feedback this week about mask wearing and the board of health order as well and i haven't 
I'll be honest, I've heard from a number of residents that haven't responded. I've been working on a response um, and working with Susan Rasp. Uh, the Board of Health has been, they've been kind of talking amongst themselves about whether or not they need to um, change the language of the order or refine it. You know, the to say to, to, to members of the community are, um, you know, it's the, the reports of people yelling at others, cursing at other people for not wearing a mask, um, you know, isn't really, if you really feel compelled to, to say, to, to, to tell someone you have a problem with them not wearing a, a mask, it's really important you do it with kindness and respect. Um, and for those who go out without a face covering, because they, they believe that they can maintain at least six feet of separation, uh, my suggestion is having a face covering on your person, but not necessarily over your nose and mouth, is also a sign of kindness and respect to those who are uh, anxious by the lack of, of mask wearing. And it really is a two way street. And I hear from both sides regularly. And I just, I just need to, to say, you know, it, it's not an individual's job to enforce the board of health order, but we all have a responsibility to do, you know, everything we can and, and honestly go the extra mile. It, it, it's clear by now that there is a rift developing between people who don't feel like they need to wear a mask because they can keep separation and people who feel like they, people should be wearing masks all the time. And I guess I, I'm on the side of it, it isn't as great an inconvenience to have a mask on, even if it's not over your nose and mouth. And it has the happy side benefit of reducing the risk of community spread of, of, of you getting infected or spreading it to somebody else. And so that's what I think the intent of the board of health order was. And that's why I think, you know, I, I supported how it was worded. And so I hope people who are, he if they're hearing this, just understand, you know, the, 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 the inconsistency between the governor's order and the board of health order really isn't the issue. It's what's the right thing for us to do for each other so we can get, so we can prove that we can handle this reopening. Um, so I, I'll, again, uh, I feel like I do this every week, but it, it, I think the board knows it. I'm sure you all get contacts from people as well. It, 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 it the, this is a big issue and people are really concerned about it. So um, I hope people will take that advice um, to heart. So um, in addition to the reopening of town offices, uh, we have some regular business things going on. Uh, you know, the, the climate action plan is a long awaited um, report. That's been um, the work of a dedicated committee as well as um, many hours of town staff. It's, uh, I saw, I saw kind of an initial draft of it. It's, it's really an excellent, excellent, um, report or, or certainly the format of it is very approachable. Uh, our sustainability director, Kate Hanley has done a masterful job, you know, squiring that through numerous processes. So there is a final draft. It did have a review with the, with the, with the climate action plan committee. Um, we got some great feedback. We're going to keep working towards the final draft. Um, one of the things that's interesting is CDC guidance for surface contact changed a little bit overnight. I saw that in the news this morning. And so both for um, the reopening of our facilities, as well as our, meaning our recreational facilities, um, as a, and our town facilities, that guidance, that change is significant. And so that's something, basically they said, the risk is much lower than they initially thought it was. So our concerns about people playing Frisbee and spreading it through you know, droplets on hard plastic, um, the research suggests that the probabilities are actually um, pretty low. But it's still important to hand sanitize, wash your hands as often as possible. Um, so speaking of that, a couple of water-related uh, things. The uh, CPW is going, our water and sewer department is going to be participating in a program to sample wastewater um, to collect data on potential, um, you know, to see if there's any uh, COVID-19 um, traceable in wastewater. And that's part of a sort of a broader study and so they're they're trying to get municipal wa uh, wastewater treatment plants to see if they can if they find it or, or submit samples for testing. Um, and the other thing is for, for water customers, uh, there'll be a notice going out about uh, a regulatory exceedance for bromate. Um, bromate is a um, byproduct of ozonation, which is in, in addition to being a fantastic word, it is our water treatment process, um, and so it is. 
it is technically, like I said, it's a technical regulatory exceedance, so the notice is required, but it is not a public health threat. There's no need to boil water or do any of that stuff. And if people have questions, they can uh, check CPW website or um, or maybe give a call, but just bearing in mind that you know we are limited staffing. Um, and I think that's about it for me. Thank you. Questions, hey. Jane? Stephen, uh, one, uh, this is exciting about the the program that that obviously Alan and the the uh, water and sewer department has been accepted into. Mm -hmm. um, I know that when uh, he was first looking into it, it wasn't clear, you know, how how many um, municipalities would be able to participate. That's really exciting. Um, second question for you was. I mean, I assume this is part of every, is this a normal spring water treatment? Yeah, so this is, this is, this has nothing to do with COVID. This is just what we do in, yeah. okay. Yeah, it's, it, it's, yeah, it's not, I don't, I've never even heard of COVID being present in, in water sources. I don't think that's. I wasn't suggesting it was, yeah, but no, I'm no, I, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I did, I did say one after the other, but one's, one's wastewater, one's water right. supply, but right. you're, and you're right, Jane, it, it, that distinction needs to be a little clearer for folks. Uh, the, and I, I did forget two things about masks. Um, one is the water department also uh, participated in a, I think it's a federal program um, through the EPA and then delivered locally through DEP, through Massachusetts DEP. Uh, they're getting about a hundred reusable masks for their team um, at no charge. So that's a good benefit. And, you know, our departments have been ordering a lot of uh, masks and PPE for our own protection of employees for out there. Uh, we had kind of a happy accident, one of our orders for the light plant and so we got um, extras. And so I was able to, to get a uh, hundred, I, uh, I believe reusable cloth. They're, they're definitely cloth masks. I believe they are reusable. And I have set those aside and offered them um, through the uh, economic vitality committee members to the business group that's getting together in this, in this very difficult time called Concord Together. And I'm gonna get them over to that group so they can, so they can distribute them to employers, businesses and their employees. Um, because we were at, we, we, Susan, if you're, we were asked about that, about being able to help get masks. So when I found out we had a bunch of extras, I said, can I just get a hundred of them? And, you know, whether it's 20 businesses getting five for themselves and their employees, or we, they hand them out uh, one at a time. I, I'm not sure I'm going to leave that up to Concord together, but um, hopefully when businesses reopen, we can help provide a measure of safety. Thank you, Terry. Uh, Stephen, I'm really excited that we're going to be opening a lot of outdoor facilities. It's great. And um, you might have seen my email there. This one person had a question about um, if it's at Willard School and it's uh, the tennis courts there are locked up. Is that a something that the school committee has to unlock them or is that part of our, are those tennis courts um, a town facility that you're going to be able to unlock? I actually honestly don't know the answer to that, Terry. I'll look into it. Okay, yeah, I just want to, and I think your point is right. This person um, who wants to play there should, you know, help, you know, help enforce or <clears throat> politely. Let, you're right, there's a rip absolutely forming, and people need to be respectful and polite on both sides. Um, athletes, and, and I think... Um, at the end of this meeting, um, I was in a meeting earlier today about with the Committee on Disabilities, and they had a few ideas about um, how we can do that, and they want to speak in the public comment at the end. Um, and my last thing is the question, um, what did you say about the library? I think I heard you say maybe in a few weeks it might start to open. <clears throat> Well, the library is, like I, I like I said, the priority one is outdoor recreational facilities. One A is library. Um, so, and actually, I blew that. Um, the Minuteman Library Network has actually developed a, a uh, I think, a software platform for a curbside book um, process. One. And that gets launched, I think, on June first, and so Con and so the main branch of the Concord Library, I believe, will have that going starting June eighth. Um, it's going to take some, you know, no one's really effectively been in the. I mean, people have been in the building, but no one's really effectively managed the processes for two and a half months. So um, 
do we need some startup time between now and the eighth? Um, so I don't see the building physically reopening yet, but certainly curbside will start. Uh, we're going to have a lot. And, and honestly, the news about the contact surface, the, the surface contact guidance was so helpful. And I immediately thought about the library this morning when I, when I heard that and then naturally neglected to mention it when I was talking about that data. Um, but no, that's so the curbside will start on, um, on June 8th at the library. Wonderful. Susan? Um, I just wanted to mention that in one of those, it, you um, provide us with a lot of information on a daily basis, Stephen. And one of the um, reports noted that the Secretary of Housing and Economic Development in the um, at the state level said that there's uh, the state website has a portal that businesses can go to to find out where they can get PPE and sanitizer and the things that all these people are going to need when when they open the doors. Yeah, we've been sharing that information through uh, Beth Williams. And there's also a uh, community development block grant um, funding source through DHCD as well that business that um, communities or businesses can apply for for assistance. Uh, I did. Th it's called a NOFA, a Notice of Funding Availability, came out I think maybe yesterday, and wow. so we did share that with um, with Beth and John uh, Harrison, Brandon Roberts, our kind of economic you know business support team right now, mm -hmm. and so. Um, I think it's going to be competitive, so I want to make sure we try and get something in as soon as possible. So I'm asking them to find out what ideas could be that, you know, do they have that could support local business uh, or other needs that may be unmet at this time. Thank you. Thank you. So I would just add, uh, Stephen, I think you started to talk about it briefly before we actually convened the meeting, but earlier today, Stephen, uh, Dean Banfield, the chair of the Finance Committee, the town moderator, and I met with our counterparts in Carlisle uh, to talk about how we were both thinking about town meeting and trying to see if we could share enough information to keep ourselves somewhat coordinated as we unfold this process. I thought that was a very good meeting and shared a lot of useful information and I suspect we'll probably meet again. Yeah, Mike, if I can just build on that point, the focus obviously was town meeting and, and the nexus for us is obviously the, the regional school district. Cool. Um, and so we had a lot of talk about timing of town meeting, but then the talk quickly pivoted to the timing of the really the state budget process. Um, and, and we don't know. In fact, a member of the Carlisle Finance Committee, I think, does in fact work for the state and... I don't think any specific information was offered there either. So we, I think there are a lot of unknowns about the state budget and I'll, I don't want to, I almost hesitate to do this because I don't have any facts, but I've heard people talking about their uh, estimates or their assumptions without really, any, I don't think anything of it's from the state, but it could be a range of the reduction in state funding. We'll get through it or a reduction in state funding that would have a serious impact on all municipalities, including Concord. And until we know more about that, it's really hard to finalize the budget. And I don't know, Carrie LaFleur, if you wanted to offer anything on that as well, but that's, it is really, nobody really knows where the state's going. Yep, I don't put her, don't put her spot. So anyway, that, that, there was a lot of discussion about that and, and Carlisle's in the same place as us where we just, we, we don't feel like we can finalize our budget. Right. All right. Thank you very much. The next item on our agenda is uh, to consider changes to the charter and extension of the charge of the Pollinator Health Advisory Committee. And Sig, you're with us. So, yeah. Uh, Hi. How are you? Greetings. I think first uh, order of business, if you could just briefly uh, tell the board uh, your intent, the committee's intention by this recommendation. Okay, thanks. Um, there are two general issues with the, 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 the charge that we felt we needed to change. One was that we've had an impossible time getting membership from all of the committees that were originally contemplated, uh, the town committees. In particular, we couldn't get anyone from the Board of Health to join us. So that's the reason for that change is that we just feel that we should stop trying to do that and just put another member of the public on. 
So that's why three citizens at large rather than two citizens at large. The other change is um, focused generally on the on the fact that as we've done our work, we've learned that um, really we started out being concerned with neonicotinoids and their impact on pollinators, but we've learned that there are really many other pesticides that can cause pollinator issues, um, and in fact, other kinds of environmental issues. So rather than focus simply on neonicotinoids, we wanted to expand our purpose to look at issues and educate on neonicotinoids and other pesticides, and expand not just to concern ourselves with impact on pollinators, but impact on the environment generally. Okay, and although it wasn't, uh, I don't recall seeing it in the uh, memorandum from your committee chair or in this, but you would like your uh, charge extended until May of 2021. Right. We like doing this so much that we want to keep on going. That's the spirit. Are there any questions for SIG? Um, I, I had a question in terms of, of your meetings and and the Ag Committee, because it seems to me that, you know, tight coordination or certainly communication, especially as we go into another growing season, might be might be useful. Yeah, we, we have, um, Brian Kramer is on right. both committees. Um, he does the job well. I mean, there's, there's no question that we know what they're doing and they know what we're doing. Is that, is that was your, your issue? It, it's not an issue. It's just a reiterate, reiteration for anyone watching that you know that that's going to be uh, very important. Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. And Brian's doing it, and 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 well. Are so there, in that, Mike, may I? Linda, please. Yeah, um, in that same vein, um, while you may be having difficulty getting a representative from the Board of Health, um, will you continue to? If you have any recommendations or so forth, outreach to them to get their feedback because I think that seems to be valuable. Yeah, well, we've tried. I, I don't know what more we can do other than to let them know what we're doing, um, but uh, it would be great. I, I, I would rather not give up on trying to get someone from the Board of Health to join us, but if we can't, we can't. So, I think Linda's point was that whether or not there's a representative on your committee, it would probably be wise uh, to any time you folks were planning any kind of action or recommendation to make sure you at least solicited the input of the Board of Health, and I'm yeah. sure we would do that. We've been doing that, yeah. yes. Very good. Any additional questions or comments? So if there's uh, no objection, Linda, I'd propose that we move that we accept these changes and extend the uh, charge of the committee until May of 2021. Uh, so move. Is there a second? Say it, please. Second. Thank you. Would the clerk please call the roll? Yes, Ms. Hotchkiss? Aye. Ms. Bates? Aye. Ms. Ackerman? Aye. Aye. Myself, Linda Escobedo, aye. Thank you, and I note that it passes unanimously. Thanks, Sig. Great. Appreciate your coming. Thanks. Take it easy. The next item on our agenda is to extend the charge of the Affordable Housing Trust Bylaw Committee. And we are joined, we were joined. Is Keith? Oh, there he is. There hi, I Keith. Hi, Mike. Hello, all. So, would you tease this up for us? Sure, uh, Keith Bergman, 56 White Ave, uh, reporting from my front porch uh, and uh, chairing the uh, Affor Affordable Housing uh, Trust uh, Study Committee, uh, whose uh, term of office uh, is set to expire on May 31st. And that date was, we've been extended a number of times, most recently to so that, uh, uh, we would be in existence for about a month following the date, the plan date of the annual town meeting in, in April. Uh, from the discussion uh, last week at the uh, chair uh, breakfast meeting, 
uh, hosted by Mike. Uh, it seemed that it was uh, appropriate to uh, request an extension of the committee's uh, existence, uh, I, I would say probably a month. Uh, the end of the month that follows the date of the, uh, the annual town meeting, and I would uh, I would defer to you all on when that is. Uh, if from from the discussion of its its plan for September, uh, then a term through October thirty first uh, might be uh, appropriate. If it if it's uh, just by way of example, but uh, we do want to do some outreach uh, uh, leading up to the town meeting when it is held, and we would uh, be uh, want to stay on. Uh, uh, for, for a month beyond the date of that town meeting. And so that's the request. Thank you. Are there questions for Keith? So, um, hi, Keith Linda Escobedo. Um, this is not so much a question as a comment to all of us to consider. Um, the extension that occurred for that committee was vis-a-vis um, -vis, uh, reappointment um, to extend through um, May 31, as opposed to changing anything in the charge. So um, I'm not sure how we want to, if we want to do that same thing again, or if we actually want to change the language in the charge. And if we do change the language in the charge, I just want to point out to Jeremy, it's, it's helpful um, in the reprint of the charge to be sure in the upper right-hand corner to um, note the date that the amendment was made. Got you. Yes, thank you, Linda. I, I, um, I think the, uh, the, uh, the extending to the membership of committees until the end of town meeting uh, was something we did handle before, as I recall, in amending APP 10, if that's what it was. But I think that, I think for this purpose, we need to keep the committee intact as well as its membership. So my suggestion would be that the motion be to uh, continue the charge of this committee until 30 days following the annual town meeting. And that way it would give them a little bit of time after the town meeting in case there's some cleanup that has to happen or uh, some other action that's taken at town meeting for them to continue to participate. So that's my two cents on that. Jane, did, was it? So, so what you're saying is we don't need to say a date. Let's just say we'll just pivot it to or pin it to the town meeting. Yeah, why not? We don't know. Yeah, it's gonna yeah. Be, you know makes sense. Just be, a, just be doing it over and over. Yeah, we keep right. Terry? Well, the only thing is, there's a, still a possibility, I guess, that we might have some kind of a town meeting that's very limited in September, and maybe only do one, two twelfths of the budget, or and not do anything else. I really don't know yet. So maybe it needs to be um, extended until we have a town meeting that addresses this bylaw, which may, I hope it comes soon, but it may be next spring by the time we get to it. Well, Terry is right that the way the town moderator has talked to us that uh, if there is still a public health risk, she would likely propose that many of the articles that are on the current town board be postponed indefinitely and uh, I don't know yet because we haven't made any decision about that, which of the articles it would be, but it could be the case that this would be one that would be postponed. So I think your idea is a good one. Why don't we, why don't, can you cast that in some language that the clerk could read, Terry? Well, I, w I would propose that the extension be granted until such time as town meeting um, is able to vote on the proposed bylaw that this committee is developing. By proposed warrant article. Right. Mm -hmm. Linda, did you catch enough of that to say it? Um, I hope so. <laughs> so as, before I ask you to do that, please, are there other questions or comments that the board has? About? All right, then Linda, I would propose that you um, Give it a try, right? Um, move to extend the charge of the Affordable Housing Trust Committee 
um, to be granted until such time um, as the proposed warrant um, article uh, that the committee is um, responsible for um, is covered or is included and addressed in the 2020, oh, in the next town meeting, I guess, annual town meeting. Is that clear enough to everybody? So the charge is being extended until the warrant article is addressed by town meeting. Yes, Susan? Did, did you want to put 30 days after that? Yes, we did. So, it's 30, so the motion is the charge of the committee will be extended until, will be extended 30 days after the annual town meeting addresses the warrant article. All right, is that clear? And if it is, could somebody please second? Well, um, don't even say annual town meeting, just say town meeting, just in case it's a special. Okay. The charge of the committee will be extended 30 days beyond a town meeting in which this warrant article is addressed. Second. And is there a second then? Yes. Second. Thank you. Any further comments? Would the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Hotchkiss? Aye. Ms. Bates? Aye. Ms. Ackerman? Aye. Mr. Lawson? Aye. Myself, Linda. Escobedo, aye. Thank you, and I know it passes unanimously. Thank you, Keith. Thanks very much. Appreciate it a lot. And, and I know, if, are you? if I could just thank you to the uh, to the uh, uh, town uh, uh, employees and and our uh, leadership. Uh, you're doing a great job for us uh, during this time, and it's very much appreciated. The next item on our agenda is a vote to authorize bonds. Uh, CFO on the floor. Good afternoon. Last week we received bids on actually both bonds and a short term note. The bonds in the amount of $5,665,000, and it was a 10 year issue, and a one year note in the amount of $3 million. We received six bids on the bonds, and we rank them according to true interest costs. So we take the the original interest cost, and we net out the premium to the true interest cost. The lowest bid was received by Fidelity Capital Markets, and the true interest cost is 0.848%, which includes a premium of $948,000. Um, I did provide you a tabulation showing all of the six bids, and you'll note that the spread on from the, the best bid the least favorable bid was 0.145%, which was very tight, but it was, this spread is actually about double what it was last year. Yeah, that's right. Wow. Somewhat surprising. Um, so as is allowed in the original authorization of the debt, we are able to resize the issue to take into account the premium. So while we were, we took bids on $5,665,000, Taking into account the premium, we're able to reduce that issuance to $4,925,000. Um, so the, re the remainder of the premium goes to pay for the issuance costs, which were about $76,000. The estimated savings as a result of, of the premium is to the median household over the life of the bond is $102.41. Um, I did provide you a list in the memorandum of the items to be permanently financed through this issue. And, and you've seen this before because this is the third time I've been in front of you on this particular issue for different legal requirements. We then received um, five bids on the notes. The winning bid was from Piper Sandler and Company with a net interest cost of 1.04%. So it, it's interesting yeah. to note that the 10-year bonds received a more favorable bid than the one-year note. Um, the one-year note will go to f partially financed water system improvements, um, which really is the treatment plant that was authorized under Article 28 of the 2016 Annual Town Meeting. 
As I mentioned to you last week, we went through a rating review and the town, the town's AAA bond rating was confirmed. So that was good. Um, as the treasurer last week, I, I um, temporarily accepted the best bids on both the bonds and notes on behalf of the town. The item before you this, this afternoon is to, um, to finalize that acceptance on both the, the bonds and the notes. I also included some comparison data on the, um, you know, how we did in comparison to other AAA rated communities last week. I don't have this available to share on the screen, uh, but it was included in your packet. You can see that, that we, um, our issue, even though it was a 10 year issue and the other two issues were 30 year issues, we, we did quite favorable. Um, in, in some instances, one of the communities got slightly better rates than we did in some of the specific years. And I think that has to do with the length of the, of the issue. Sometimes, um, you know, a 30 year issue maybe is, is what a, um, the, an investment firm is looking for. And so they, they price that a little more competitive than a 10 year issue. Um, unfortunately, this is um, one item that requires a big vote, your part big in, in terms of the number of words and the vote does need to be read into um, in its entirety. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions for Curry? Same. I'll just make uh, one quick comment, however. So, some of you may have um, heard at the Finance Committee that um, Carrie and her department were recognized as rock stars uh, on this item. And I have to say that was the best retort. Her, uh, her reaction to that comment was the best retort I had heard all week. And that was, um, yes, thank you. Uh, that's what we always knew. <laughs> <laughs> If, if I could add one thing, not to what Linda said, but one thing I wanted to mention to you, you know, typically, as you know, we have town meeting in April and we do this bond issue in May or June. And so we have to make estimates on what we think the debt service, the annual debt service will be related to the bond issue while we're putting the budget together. So one of the reasons that we typically end the fiscal year with a little bit extra in our debt service appropriation is because we're conservative in the estimate on, on the annual debt service. Because we've had town meeting, we don't have any way to account for that savings. So this year, because town meeting is happen, happening after the bond issue, what we will be able to do is go back and revise what we've included in the budget for, for debt, annual debt service for this particular group of projects. And that revision will be close to $90,000. No. That will be um, one reduction to the budget that was put forward back in December. On the downside, that means we've already taken it into account so it won't become part of our free cash at the end of next fiscal year. But I think given everything that's happening uh, people will appreciate that we're able to take that savings now. Yep, I agree. Thank you. Are there any questions for Curry? All right. Are there any objections to proceeding with the motion? Seeing none, Linda? Okay. This is a long one, as Curry indicated. Um, Move that the sale of the four million nine hundred and twenty-five thousand general obligation municipal purpose loan of twenty twenty bonds of the town dated June eighteenth, twenty twenty, uh, referred to as the bonds, to Fidelity Capital Markets, a division of National Financial Services LLC, at the price of five million seven hundred and twenty-seven thousand three hundred and ninety-nine, and dollars and twenty-one cents, and accrued interest is hereby approved and um, confirmed. The bonds shall be payable on June 15th of the years and in the principal amounts and bear interest at the respective rates as follows. Um, the interest rate that will be referenced is 5% for all, all the um, items I will now read. For the year 2021, in the amount of 870,000. 2022, in the amount of 795,000. 
2023 in the amount of 790,000, 2024 in the amount of 680,000, 2025 uh, in the amount of 665,000, 2026 in the amount of 230,000, 2027 in the amount of 230,000, 2028 in the amount of 230,000, 2029 in the amount of 230,000, and in the year 2030 in the amount of 205,000. Um, we also moved to approve the sale of $3 million at 2% general obligation bond anticipation notes of the town dated June 19th, 2020, and payable June 18th, 2021, subsequently referred to as the notes, uh, to Piper Sandler and Company at par and accrued interest rate, uh, interest plus a premium of $28,620. Move that in connection with the marketing and sale of the bonds, the preparation and distribution of a notice of sale and preliminary official statement dated May 6, 2020, and a final official statement dated May 13, 2020, each and in such form as may be approved by the town treasurer, be in hereby verified, confirmed, approved, and adopted. Move that the town treasurer and the select board be, and hereby are, authorized to execute and deliver continuing and significant events, disclosure undertakings, in compliance with SEC Rule 15C2-12, in such forms as may be approved by bond council to the town, which undertaking shall be incorporated by reference to the bonds and notes as applicable for the benefit of the holders of the bonds and notes from time to time. Move that any certi certificates or documents relating to the bonds and notes, collectively the documents, may be executed in several counterparts, each of which shall be regarded as an original and all of which shall constitute one and the same document. Delivery of an executed counterpart of a signature page to the document by electronic mail in a PDF file or by other electronic transmission shall be as effective as delivery of a manually executed counterpart signature page to such document and electronic signatures on any of the documents shall be deemed original signatures for the purposes of the documents and all matters related thereto, having the same legal, legal effect as original signatures. Move that we authorize and direct the town treasurer to establish post-issuance federal tax compliance procedures and continuing disclosure procedures in such forms as the town treasurer and bond council deem sufficient or if such procedures are currently in place to review and update said procedure in order to monitor and maintain the tax exempt status of the bonds and notes and to comply with relevant security laws. Move that each member of the select board, the town clerk and the town treasurer be and hereby are authorized to take any and all such actions and execute and deliver such certificates, receipts or other documents as may de be determined by them or any of them to be necessary or convenient to carry into effect the provisions of the foregoing votes. Is there a second? Second. Will the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Hotchkiss? Aye. Ms. Bates? Aye. Mr. Lawson? Aye. Ms. Ackerman? Aye. Myself, Linda Escobedo, aye. Thank you, and I note it passes unanimously. Thank you very much, uh, Carrie. Appreciate it. The next item on our agenda is a consolidation of polling locations for the June 11th, 2020. The town clerk is with us, Madam Town Clerk. Thank you very much. I'm here, I'm Kari Maitari here, and I'm here on behalf of the Board of Registrars to ask for your support and vote to consolidate polling locations to the Concord Carlisle Gymnasium, a large <clears throat> air-conditioned space that can accommodate the five precincts for the June 11th election only. Um, the registrars met last Wednesday, um, had good discussion, had input from uh, League of Women Voters members, and the reasons that they recommend this action is out of concern for the health and safety of our voters and our election workers, the fact that fewer than half of our election workers are able to work at the polls, um, a centralized location will facilitate cleaning of the voting booths when voters do use them. And um, a large number of voters are already voting absentee or early. The latest numbers that I have um, is that we've sent out 
477 absentee ballot applications and 298 early ballot applications, a total of 773. Uh, last year, the voter turnout with one race in the election was a little over 1,400 voters, so we're more than halfway there with uh, mail-in voting already. Uh, I have consulted with Health Director Susan Rask, and I have visited the school, and with thanks to Dr. Hunter for um, allowing us to use the space, and Michael Mastrullo, um, Jared Stanton for helping coordinate everything, and Russell the facilities director who allowed me to, to walk through the gymnasium and location. I will also be um, visiting the location with uh, Walter Lada, assistant fire chief, and Kevin Monahan, police lieutenant, to make sure that all health and safety measures are in place. Now, the entrance that we would propose is to the right of the cafeteria entrance that, that is used for town meeting. The entrance to the right actually has parking that is closer to that entrance. There is a long hall, which will allow for uh, the, the distancing if people, if there is a line. And then the entrance would be from, from that end of the gym, so from the opposite end of the cafeteria. And we can easily accommodate five precincts inside this location. After voting, um, voters would exit out of the entrance into the cafeteria and exit out of those doors. And if, uh, if you vote to support this, then we will have to send a notice out to all voters, which we would do by postcard mailing at least two weeks before the election, which is also another opportunity to remind them on how to vote early by mail. Because while you know we've reached a lot of people through social media and electronic means, there are still a lot of people who don't use that type of technology. And this would be a wonderful way to reach out to them as well. Would it, would, I think we may have, it appears to me as if she's frozen. Oh no. No, somebody waved their magic Unfrozen wand. There it is. Are you back? I'm here. Did okay. you not hear all of what no, I said? We can hear you I'm now, sorry. but you look, okay. you look like we lost you for a minute. Perhaps you could uh, uh, just take this opportunity too to explain to people what they should do if they'd like an absentee ballot. Absolutely. So we have absentee ballots and we have early ballots. And the, the difference primarily is that absentee, um, typically you need a a reason to vote absentee, whereas an early ballot is just to ask for uh, a ballot without any reason that you're asking other than you don't want to vote in person. So all that people really need to do is send us a request that is signed. You can email the request, but we need to have that signature, including your name, date of birth, your legal voting address, and the address to mail the ballot. And that's really all we need. That signature is important though. It has to be a physical signature? It needs to be a physical signature, but you can you know, jot a note down, take a picture with your yeah. smartphone and email that to us at townclerk at conqueredma.gov. Um, we also have the applications on our website on the town clerk's page. Um, Aaron Stevens has, has done a nice job putting a notice right on the town's front page that, that will link a person right to our page that has all of the information in the forums. And I'd also like to thank the league for um, doing a, a public service announcement um, that I was involved with to explain how to vote early. So, and they also have um, some PowerPoints that are on our website and also on the league's website on just to really break it down and explain to people how to do it. Right. Thank you. Are there any questions for the town clerk? Carrie, I know you're um, anticipating a, a, a light count uh, because so many have uh, mailed in their ballots ahead of time. And you probably um, took this into consideration, but it should inclement weather day. Is there going to be any kind of um, 
Is there a plan for how people would line up? Well, the benefit of this particular entrance is that there's a, a long hallway. So um, I don't think it will be any problem at all. Good. With lining people up. And and for town elections, we don't we don't typically have a huge turnout, but because we're open, polling hours would still be from 7 a.m. until 8 p.m. There is plenty of time to allow for, you know, to to keep any kind of lines from forming, I think. And, you know, right now people are still being advised not to go out unless it's, you know, for for those emergency supplies or, you know, doctor's visits, things like that. So people are tending not to want to go out. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional questions? Well, this seems to be a very well thought out plan. And I just want to thank you, Kari, and thank the school department. I think it's probably going to go really well. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank um, Pat and Nate in my office for doing all this work. And when you think about 775 absentee and early ballot applications, you know, right now we're getting upwards of 60 requests a day. So mm -hmm. it's busy here mm -hmm. and they are really keeping up with it well. Uh, Jane? I had one question uh, with. Yes less to do with how we we vote on the 11th, but more to do with the um, the elections that are being voted on. There's been a big lag in terms of communication between um, when we were expecting to vote at the end of uh, March and then June 11th. And I'm wondering, are there any um, processes in place to sort of uh, renew people's um, understanding of the elections? Well, as far as who's running? Who's running any of that? I mean, you know, typically the, the League of Women Voters holds the forum right beforehand. I mean, it's just there's the momentum is different now. I know that they've talked about holding a forum. I'm not sure if they have already. Yes. It's on um, Wednesday, May 27th. Perfect. The, the candidates forum held by the League. It'll be held by Zoom. And it's going to have all the people running for election. Um, so I guess look on the League of Women Voters website, or maybe they can hook up with you, Kari, or whatever. But no, it's on the 27th, next Wednesday. Good. Thank, you. Thank you. Thanks, Terry. And I'll also say that, that the voter registration deadline, even though we already had one for this election, because it's been um, delayed, we have another voter registration deadline, which is 10 days before the election. So June 1st will be a voter registration deadline. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, if there are no other questions for the town clerk, uh, I think we're ready for a motion, Linda. A move to consolidate the polling locations to the Concord Carlisle High School Gymnasium for the June 11th, 2020 town election. Is there a second? Second. Now for the discussion, would the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Hotkiss? Aye. Ms. Bates? Aye. Ms. Ackerman? Aye. Mr. Lawson? Aye. Myself, Linda Escovedo, aye. Thank you, and I know it passes unanimously. Thank you, Carrie, very much. Thank you very much. The next item on our agenda is to authorize me to send a congratulatory letter to Cho recognizing the award of a National Merit Scholarship. Uh, Mr. Cho is a student at Middlesex School, and I've reached out to the head of Concord Academy, Mr. Hardy, and to our own superintendent, Dr. Hunter. And my uh, hope is that when we hear back from them at a subsequent meeting, we'll be able to do the same thing that I'm recommending uh, for Mr. Cho for those additional students. So this is quite a quite an accomplished young man, a, a pianist uh, of some note already, uh, and so I would uh, be willing to have a motion to authorize me to generate a congratulatory letter to Mr. Cho. Move to authorize the chair to send a congratulatory letter to Mr. Cho. Um, second. second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Linda, will you please call the roll? Sorry. Ms. Hotchkiss? Aye. Ms. Bates? Aye. 
Ms. Ackerman? Aye. Mr. Lawson? Aye. Mattel, Linda Escobedo, aye. I note that it passes unanimously. The next item, item of business is miscellaneous correspondence. We still receive uh, one, one, the latest one was this morning uh, from uh, citizens asking for a copy of the Hunt letter plan that we mm -hmm. have uh, sent off. And we also received, I think, to the town manager a letter from Anna Rasmussen, I think it was yesterday, I'm not sure, concerned about her property. Uh, I would like to turn to uh, public comments. If anyone has a public comment, uh, please unmute yourself or whatever it might be and we'll call on you. Yes, please go ahead, Carla. Hi, this is Carlin Reed, 83 Wits End, on behalf of the League of Women Voters. Kari, thank you very much for participating in that video. And uh, thank you also for asking the question about what the League is doing on behalf of the uh, promoting the election. The, uh, uh, the program that will be on Minuteman Media Network on May 27, thank you, Terry, you were right, at 3 p.m. So we're hoping you're going to join us and watch it on MMN TV. I build, I'm not sure if it's going to be streamed live, but it will at least be recorded. We'll have a moderator and the candidates. Thank you. And am I remembering correctly that there is a way for citizens to submit questions? Yes, there is. And it's to be sent in as quickly as possible so that we can get it in. Um, and uh, we, you can send it to president at lwvcc.org if you wish. Thank you, Mike. Do you think it would be appropriate, Stephen, for us to see if we could get Aaron to put a link or something on the homepage or in news and notices? Would that be appropriate? Um, sure. Sure, Carl. Do you, if you, Carl, if you have a um, like a flyer, for lack of a better term, and you wanted to send that to Aaron, copy me. I'll, I'll make sure she puts something out about it. We'll, we'll do. I'll work with Judy Zahnbrecher and Susan Fry about that. Thank you very much. Right. Sure. Thank you, Carlin. Are there any additional uh, comments, public comments? Yes. Please. Yes. Go ahead, Mary Beth. Thank you. My name is Mary Beth Barker. I live at 49 Seymour Street. And um, I just wanted to ask, I don't know that I have the answers to this, but I wanted to ask the select board to give it some consideration. I am a person that I have a disability. And although I also serve on the disability commission, I'm speaking for myself, open meeting laws, I can't really speak for other people on the commission. And um, I have noticed that um, it has become more and more difficult and for people who have physical disabilities, not just mobility ones, I, I myself have a mobility disability, but people with other disabilities, such as, you know, maybe visual impairment, people who are blind, that it has become almost impossible to be able to use some of the um, trails, the like the Bruce Freeman Trail and other uh, parks for that, you know, we're spe which is we're specifically designed, some of them, to be sensitive to people with disabilities. And some of what is going on is that there are athletes, bicyclists and jogger and jog, you know, um, joggers runners who feel like um, they don't want to use a mask because maybe it impairs their ability. You know, they're exerting a lot of energy and I can understand why they won't. But when you're a person who uses a wheelchair or you use a walker or some other device, cane, whatever, you really don't have the liberty to just step off the trail. I mean, you, you're just you can't do that. You can't step into the woods. And I have seen that it's even difficult for able-bodied people. They don't want to step into the woods and be exposed to ticks and things. But um, if somebody with a visual impairment, person who's blind, you know, their cane can help them find their way on the uh, trail. Their cane can help them hear that maybe there's someone coming, but it doesn't tell them whether or not that person wears a mask, has a mask on, and is uh, is going to... Uh, is going to move over for them uh, to give them the six foot social distancing. And it's just, it's something that's becoming, I feel, you know, I see, I, I, I watch, um, I, I read the 
social media site next door neighbor. And I see more and more this attitude developing of, well, if you have a problem, then if you have uh, some kind of an immune compromise condition or if you're not safe, then don't, then don't, stay home, stay out of the way. And I don't think that's the right thing to do. Um, I think that there needs to be a greater education or sensitivity to why you need to wear masks. I mean, for everybody, but I'm speaking right now, particularly as a person with a physical disability that I rely on my wheelchair. Uh, um, I have a special walker that I use. And I can't step off the sidewalk unless there's a curb cut. I can't step off the trail into the woods. The devices aren't designed for that, uh, you know. So and I wanted to ask people on the um, board to give it some thought. And I don't know if there are recommendations can be made about better enforcement or special hours, special athlete-free hours or special safe zones for people who, that's kind of what I'm thinking. All right, thank you, Mary Beth. Why don't I suggest that uh, we give you thought, but I would also suggest that you return to your disability commission and ask them the same question. And we've discussed it. Yeah, we have. You could, uh, yeah. Perhaps your commission could come back to the select board with some set of recommendations or thoughts about how we might proceed. And uh, when you've done that, why don't you shoot me a note, and we'll get you on the agenda for our next meeting and we'll, we'll have a discussion about that. I think it's a pretty important point, so let's let's get right to work. Okay, thank you. I will um, I will ask them to put it on the agenda for right. discussing thank it on next much. meeting. Thank comments. you. Are there any additional public yes, comments? Yes, please. May I, may I speak? Who is who is this? This is Susanna Kay from 366 Estabrook Road. Sure, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, this is just uh, a written six or seven sentences. The Rob family and the K. Reed family council, Mr. Nislick has requested to discuss with the town the currently closed 900 foot section of our private trail at the end of Estabrook Road. We have not gotten a reply from the town and we like the town would like a cost efficient solution. And as it has been explicitly stated that our select board members will not speak with us directly. We are publicly requesting a response. Please understand that this is in part an effort to address the issues of ongoing vandalism and abuse, such as the smearing of excrement and repeated urination on property owners' gates and stone walls. Actually, Mr. Lawson, you referred to that communication from uh, Anna Rasmussen earlier, I believe. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Are there any additional public comments? I don't see anybody. If that is the case, then I would propose, Madam Clerk, that we... Um, uh, Mike, before we, before we adjourn, I wanted to... I, I know we talked about starting our liaison updates, and I don't think we're quite ready. Right. But I did want to give a, an update on our NAGOG efforts, if that's an option. Sure. Okay, um, and this is really important because we've had a number of, um, it's been a while since we've discussed NAGOG as a select board, um, or at least the updates to it. This is clearly an important project for Concord um, and, uh, and our uh, public water accessibility. And there have been some, three, um, uh, three advances that are worthy of, of noting. First, um, it, references the status of our Water Management Act litigation uh, with Littleton and Acton. And the, uh, the short form of that is that the, um, the SJ, that uh, Littleton and Acton and Concord all uh, uh, filed appeals uh, or filed appeals. Um, all three towns were granted the, uh, were agreed to submit an application for direct appellate review to the Supreme Judicial Court. Um, and the SJC agreed to hear the case on direct appellate review on May 13th, which reduces the amount of time uh, for the entire appeals process and reduces the costs of the appeals. So as there's only going to be one SJC 
uh, one appeal to the SJC rather than the potential for two layers of appeal with a preliminary review of the of the court. Uh, Littleton and Acton are going to be filing theirs June twenty second, and Concord will have thirty days to to um, uh, uh, to uh, respond. So that's one uh, movement forward. Uh, second, and perhaps. Um, more important is that the uh, is the status of the special permit for the uh, from the Acton Board of Selectmen for the construction of the Naga Pond water treatment facility and intake and the intake pipe replacement. This is the uh, meeting that happened on the 19th, and um, the uh, Acton Select Board uh, decided to extend the special permit uh, for uh, the construction through January 6, uh, 2022, which is the same expiration date for the order, uh, the order of conditions for the water treatment um, plant issued by the Conservation Commission. This is going to be extremely helpful. Um, we were we were past the technical initial um, special permit date, but that had been extended under um, the COVID-19 emergency. This gives us a concrete um, extension. Um, and the final piece, and obviously Conquer, uh, Conquer will be, um, has been and will be continue to work very closely with the officials from the town of Acton. Um, one of the important parts of that special permit is a, a communications plan, which uh, uh, Concord uh, submitted a, a first draft of, and I know that we're uh, working through components of that with Acton to make sure that it, it meets everybody's needs. Um, and the final piece is our Chapter 191 license from the Mass DEP. This is for our intake project, which is the first phase of any effort uh, at NAGOG. And Concord filed for a Chapter 91 license in February of 2019. It's been a very long process, um, unusually so, and we hope to see the license issued very soon. So that's that's NAGOG in uh, very short order. But with I, I do want to give kudos to both our council and most importantly our um, our water and sewer and, and public works department. This has been a, an incredible process to have witnessed over the last four years. Yeah, indeed. Thank you very much for that uh, update. I appreciate that. I want to say that at the uh, our meeting next uh, next Thursday at the same time, We'll have two, we'll have a number of agenda items, but I just want to call out the fact that we will receive from the town and from the regional district their 112th spending plan to go forward. So we will have the opportunity to receive those. I know they've been working on them and receive them next time, and hopefully we'll get them a little bit ahead of time uh, so we have a chance to review them. But those will be very important agenda items for us next time so they can get these plans submitted to the Department of Revenue. Uh, be, be, so that we'd be ready to go uh, July 1st. Is there no other comments? Uh, I, I have a comment. Uh, this is Brooks, Brooks Reed at 366 Estabrook Road. Uh, you, you mentioned earlier that my across the street neighbor, uh, NRS Musson, submitted a letter. I also submitted a letter this week uh, regarding the alteration of public comments submitted for the April 16th uh, select board meeting. And I wonder if you could just acknowledge that you've received that communication from me earlier this week. I think Mark, we did receive it, but I thought it was addressed to the town manager. It, it had your name, it had all the select board members' names, it had the town manager's names, and it was also submitted into public info at concordtomat.gov. And it has not been put in the record along with all the other public comments submitted to the uh, that address, and it remains uh, unincluded in that information. And I, uh, would appreciate it if it was included along with other people's comments. Thank you. There's no other uh, comments from the public. I'm seeing one. Uh, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. Second. Second. Would the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Hotchkiss? Aye. Ms. Bates? Aye. Ms. Ackerman? Aye. Mr. Lawson? Aye. Myself, Linda Escobedo? Aye. I pass it unanimously. I thank you all very much for attending and we'll see you next Thursday at four o'clock.